My name is John Adams, and I am blessed to be the current steward of the CASA El Dorado program. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And um, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about what is CASA, what does CASA do, what makes the CASA program in El Dorado County special, and um, hopefully uh, answer some questions that you may have about the program, the work we do, and uh, the results. And the history on CASA is that back in the late 70s, there was a judge in the Seattle area who was working in the juvenile court system, working with kids in foster care. And uh, he felt like what he really wanted was to, in, a, in addition to the, the opinions and advice of the attorneys and the social workers who are uh, tasked by law to look after the best interest of the child, he wanted yet another uh, voice in this process. And that voice was one that could be uh, independent of any agenda, uh, someone who uh, had the time and the wherewithal to get to know the child, to get to spend time with the child and the folks within that child's life that are important, and to essentially offer the court uh, a, a sort of an independent view of what's going on with this child, what are their needs, what are their wants, and what can we best do to support them in the short term as well as the long term. And so that was the history. Um, this particular judge started off informally with some friends and family from the neighborhood, and over time that evolved into this thing which today we call CASA. Uh, today there's over 940 CASA operations around the country and they're all independent nonprofits, community-based organizations, uh, usually by county. In the state of California there are 45 CASA programs, so we're one of 45. Uh, our little history is we started back in 1992, uh, Judge Pat Riley uh, went to uh, a seminar down in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area about CASA programs in the early 90s. And by 1992, he had decided he wanted to start the CASA program here. He was at the time the juvenile judge in El Dorado County. And uh, that was the beginning. So uh, from a humble beginnings of volunteers and board members who actually did the day-to-day -day work as well as the oversight of a board, um, evolved into today where 25 years later we're celebrating our 25th year anniversary in 2017. Uh, today we serve over 300 children per year uh, which places us about um, twice the state average believe it or not for CASA programs. The state average is about 165 kids. We serve typically about twice that many each year uh, which we're very proud of. And um, the reason for that, frankly, is uh, the fact that the community over these last 25 years has really embraced this program. I think people get it. They understand that kids that suffer abuse and neglect and who end up, therefore, in the foster care system through no fault of their own are kids who really could benefit from having an advocate, uh, both formally within the court system as well as a consistent positive adult in their life to help mentor them through day-to-day -day life. And that's really what CASA, what CASA advocates do. So, so the CASA advocates, as we talked about a moment ago, are really volunteers. They are the heart and the soul of the CASA program. And here in El Dorado County, we typically have about 150 to 160 volunteers at any point in time, and as I say, serving about 300 plus kids each year. So again, these are kids who have suffered abuse, some form of abuse and or neglect. Um, the case has risen to the point where um, the judge, the juvenile judge in El Dorado County, either here in Placerville or in our satellite location in, in uh, Lake Tahoe, has deemed that it's appropriate to remove that child from their home and place them into some form of foster care. And that's when CASA comes into action. The judge also, on a case-by-case -case basis, can ask us through an order to please serve this child with a, with a caring, consistent CASA volunteer. My name is Michelle, and I've been um, with CASA for about 14 years now. And I started, uh, I was a legal secretary, so I had an interest in the law. And then when I heard about CASA, I, um, of course wanted to work there and so I sort of 
uh, evolved into the position that I have now and what I do is I manage the volunteers and um, we go to court with them, I help them file their court reports which is their voice that is their opportunity to present the information that they've gathered to the court and to the attorneys and to the social worker. Advocates are really information gatherers. Um, they are the ones that are most connected to these children. They see them weekly. Um, they do activities with the child. So they get to know what they need or what they're not getting. Um, they also meet with the parents and they talk to them about what, um, what they need to do to get their child back. They talk to teachers, they can talk to doctors, they can talk to therapists. Anyone that has anything to do with these foster children, they can have a conversation with them and get information. When a child is removed from their parents' home by CPS, they're oftentimes placed with a relative um, or a foster parent. This is a stranger, someone they don't know. Um, they try to place them with a relative. That's preferable, but that doesn't happen often. They're placed with a foster home. They know nothing of these people. They're strangers. It's a strange bed. It's a strange uh, house rules. Everything is different. Um, and so the advocate, they're requested to serve these children by the court. And when they meet the child, they meet them in the home that they're at, whether it's grandparents, foster home, and they follow that child wherever they end up because placement is always an issue. These kids can be placed in multiple foster homes. It's just the reality. When there's court hearings, the advocate always goes to court, usually on Fridays, sometimes on Tuesdays, um, but they're always there. They're getting information. They're, they're able to talk to the attorney at court. They're able to sometimes see the social worker. Sometimes the children go and sometimes they don't. I think sometimes uh, kids just don't want to have anything to do with the court. They, it's just another hassle and maybe they don't understand it. Depending on the age of the child, I, I've seen kids that are in high school age and they will go to court. They are interested in what's happening or they, they want to tell the court something. Maybe sometimes they just want to get out of school. I don't know. Don't blame them. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really, you know, when a child is 10, I believe it's 10, they have the right to go to court. So if they want to go to court, they can tell their attorney or they can tell the CASA and we'll make sure they get there. Um, these cases typically last about a year and a half. Sometimes they go much longer. Thankfully, sometimes they're shorter. But again, the average is about a year and a half. So it's a fairly significant uh, investment of time and energy. Uh, the training to become a CASA volunteer is about 30 hours uh, for the first year to get certified. And then we require another 12 hours of continuing education each year thereafter in order to maintain that certification. Um, in terms of the time that it takes to do this, I would tell you that most of the volunteers tell us that they spend on average 10 to 15 hours per month, uh, again, working with the child, getting to know the child, getting to establish a, a basis of trust uh, so that they can, over time, put together sort of a picture of Again, where's this child today? What are their needs? What are their wants? What can we do for them in the short term in terms of the kinds of services and support they need to better recover from what they've been through? And then from a longer term perspective, what is really going to be the best placement op option for that child? And those options, by the way, could range anywhere from uh, re reinstatement back with the family uh, of, of origin or adoption or placement with a relative in a kinship care arrangement uh, or in some cases uh, some other some other form of custodial care. So, um, so as you can see the CASA advocate really plays a critical role in the outcome of these cases, the, the lives of these children uh, over time. So one of the questions that people typically ask is where does the funding come from to make this program work? 
And the answer to that may surprise you a little bit. I think some folks, because we're so closely aligned with the court system, and we obviously partner day to day with Child uh, Protection Services, CPS, uh, as part of the county, uh, as well as other county agencies and other private agencies. So we are kind of a spoke in the wheel that makes this thing work. Um, but because we are so closely aligned with the court and CPS and other government agencies, they kind of assume sometimes that uh, the majority of our funding actually comes from the government. And actually the, ex the exact opposite is true. Um, you know, over time what's happened from those humble beginnings of a judge in Seattle on an informal basis to today um, is that CASA actually has been adopted in the, in the uh, federal, state, and local legislation, so it's embedded in the, in the local code. So it's sort of a court mandate, if you will. Uh, the only thing that they forgot, I like to say, is the funding that goes with it. And so really what we are, if you think about it, is kind of that government mandate without the funding. Uh, we do get about 20% of our overall funding from various government funds, but the overwhelming majority of the funding that makes this program work comes from the community. And so um, to put that in perspective, it costs us about $1,500 per year to serve one foster child for, for a year with a caring, consistent CASA volunteer. In contrast, a child in the child welfare system in foster care in El Dorado County, it costs the county about $5,000 a month to have that same child in foster care. So when you look at the outcomes of CASA programs based on both federal, state, and then local research that we've done to back up the bigger, bigger research programs, one of, the, one of the many metrics that we know for sure is that when a child has a CASA advocate in their life, they are half as likely to re-enter the foster care system to come back into foster care. And so when we put that in, in perspective of the numbers of kids we serve, what that suggests is about 20 less kids per year are coming back into foster care in El Dorado County because they've had the care and support of a CASA volunteer. So what does that mean? What it means is about $1.3 million in savings for foster care that the county enjoys because of the support of our program. So when you look at $1,500 for a year to support a child with a CASA advocate as opposed to $5,000 a month, I think the, the return on investment, if you will, is pretty obvious. So one of, the, one of the many ways that we do garner the support from the community in terms of financial support, as well as obviously the volunteers that are the cornerstone of this program, is through fundraising events. And in CASA in El Dorado County, we have two main fundraising events per year. In the fall, we do sort of our signature event, Casa Blanca, which is a sit-down dinner with auction items and live auctions and uh, that sort of thing. And that, is, as I say, is our signature, our big event for the year. We also have another event that happens in the springtime that's kind of unique. Uh, I don't know of any other CASA program or any other nonprofit, for that matter, that, that does anything quite like this. And uh, we just finished our 21st year of what we call the Box Lunch event. Now, as I understand it, this event was started years ago by, again, a small group of local volunteers who had an idea which was to go out to some local businesses within the county, sell box lunches. It was a wrap, either a turkey wrap or a veggie wrap, along with some cookies and, and some juice from Barsotis and uh, some other items. And that has grown to the point where today, again, our 21st year that we just finished, we actually sold close to 3,000 lunches. And um, that was, again, all done by volunteers over the course of about two to three months. And then the day of the event, we all gather starting at about four o'clock in the morning at the Diamond Springs um, Firehouse. And we form two large assembly lines, if you will. Um, during the course of the next four to five hours, we have a couple of different shifts of folks that come in. And um, probably somewhere in the order of 125 to 150 volunteers in total uh, are actually putting together those lunches, um, putting them in their cars, and driving them out to the local businesses who have purchased them in the previous weeks and months. 
it is what I think is, is what we call sort of a, a mass chaos or organized chaos perhaps is a better way to put it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I tell you, there are some folks who have been doing it for years and years. In some cases, we have second and third generations of folks coming back to do it. It's really, when you look up the words grassroots event and you look at box lunch, that's, that's the picture you get. So in terms of the businesses who buy these box lunches, again, starting in like January, February, and then the event itself is usually in, in April, um, over the years we've expanded from, again, a handful of folks doing this to over 100 each year. And the number of businesses that participate and buy the lunches um, has gone um, from this little nucleus of, of Placerville to uh, as, as far north as, as Pollock Pines and as far south and east as uh, not just even the borders of El Dorado County, but now into some businesses in Folsom. Uh, we have a couple businesses in Rancho Cordova. So we've really expanded the reach. Now having said all that, I will tell you that we still have room to grow. We could still each year probably do another four or five hundred lunches. So if you're seeing this and you have a business somewhere in El Dorado County or close to us in Folsom or Rancho Cordova, we'd love to hear from you because we'd love to be able to add you to the list of, of happy customers. So the best way to get in touch with us is either through the website, which is casaeldorado.org, or give us a call on the phone, which is 530-622-9882, or you, anyone can contact us at info at casaeldorado.org. I also want to say that I think we have the best group of volunteers anywhere. These are really caring people. They devote so much time to these children that I'm blown away. Not only the time in court, sometimes they get there at 8.30, they have to wait three hours, but the, the time that they spend getting information, writing reports, sending emails, making phone calls, and the time that they spend with the kids. It's amazing. It is truly amazing. They are wonderful people. I, I love working here and I love working with them. Um, I just think that we just are so blessed to have a great group.